welcome to the What The Fork review show where we have won a game that I suppose doesn't really matter, but winning is nice. Uh, we are reacting immediately after the game. It's just after five o'clock, so not much uh, prepared necessarily. And I'm going to be going to the cinema, so you're probably not going to get this till in the morning. But this was sort of the hour we had to record, give or take. But uh, I'm joined by Ross Black after a win. Aye, a nice win, a nice win. Um mm-hmm. That was for Dan Ballard. Uh, yeah, we'll get into it. Didn't quite understand that one, but I'm um, also joined by Lee. I feel like it's been a bit of a while, Lee. How are you doing, mate? Is that one for Dan Ballard as well? Or? Every win is for Dan Ballard, but that one especially the DI. I thought he was um, got a lot of stick, and he thought he played really, really well and definitely deserved the win for Dan Ballard today. It's really weird. It said that you were on mute there, but I could hear everything you said. It's like, weird world. Something winning, keeping clean sheets and that. But um, Ross, like I say, look, ultimately, like I think at this point in the season, the result, the results itself aren't going to impact what happens necessarily this season. But I think we've had a quite a few weeks where, you know, Cardiff aside, it's been difficult in many ways, even the, the more positive performances or positive results have been nil-nil draws. We needed a win, I think, and I think it's a big win. I, I know there's caveats, and we'll get into what the caveats were, but a, a win's a win, and I think as we're coming towards the end of the season with Millwall at home coming up, Watford away, a couple of games there where feasibly we could win, you've just got to hope this is going to kickstart a bit of a, a winning run to the end of the season because I think if we, we have that, you go in with a much better or much more positive mindset in the summer, which is obviously massive anyway. Yeah, definitely. Um I think it would be negligent to ignore the fact that when it was 11 men v 11 men, it was one of the worst games of football ever. Um, We didn't really offer much in any attacking outlay, a a bit like Leeds, to be honest. Um, And I think that kind of shows our weaknesses, that if where we need to improve that, if we're playing the teams who are up there, we need to be able to go there and play these teams and, you know what I mean, not just defend for our lives and nick a point, but Positive side, I thought there was some good individual performances today. We mentioned Ballard there. I thought that Neil again was brilliant. He always is. Um, Callum Styles had his best game for us, by far, uh, in my opinion. Um, and again, we, we, Chris Rick, like when we weren't playing well, he was the one who was getting on the ball when he could and trying to make things happen. It wasn't always coming off, but at least the intent was there. Um, but yeah, it was it was important. I think just to that. Again, it's just a bit of positivity, isn't it? You, what you, let's be honest, we've all been a bit numb the last few months, where it's just been a bit like, oh, become a chore, hasn't it? I think it did, and then yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Then, and then and then the day again, there was parts of it where which was a chore to watch, but we have got three points away to one of the better teams in the league, and I think that was their first defeat at home in ten. Like there were ten unbeaten at home. Something like that was mentioned on the commentary. Um, but yeah, it was it was it was decent. It was decent. I think that's the way we can put it. And again, they've got some good players who I think, although they had a lot of the ball first half when it was eleven v eleven, but nullified them really. They didn't really offer much. How is it that sort of you feel about that, Lee? I think you know wins a win, which is great. But like, I'm not gonna lie, like. I think it's the first time since we've done this podcast that we haven't been involved in the playoffs. Um, so there's always been something like lying on the preview shows or the review shows. But like, let's be honest, past few weeks, we've kind of known that this season is just going to be, you know, what, what we make it, the best of what we can get from it. But I think ultimately a win was massive. And I think, you know, there's, like I say, caveats to it, the, the 10 men, which we're going to get on to and things like that. But um, I also think that's now five clean sheets and six. And if anyone ever wants to understand why Sunderland are so stupid, the one game we've conceded in the past six was five at home against Blackburn. Like, it's just, I mean, that's just Sunderland in a nutshell. But a one of the win at West Brom, you know, whether we got it against 10 men or not, I would have took that 100%. Um, it means I can enjoy me Saturday, feel a bit more positive about things moving forward and, I think, you know, our last three games are all winnable. So um, hopefully it builds a bit of momentum. And then in the summer, we can, in an ideal world, fix the the wrongs of this season and make things right and maybe give it a go next season. But I think in the call like daily, we've won 1-0 at West Brom. That's a good win, isn't 
yeah, it's a very, 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 very good win. Um, as I say, just to echo what Ross said, 11 v 11, I thought it was only looked like one team was going to win it, and that was West Brom. But again, with football, it, it swung on two minutes of absolute madness by one of their, their centre forward getting sent off, and we scored at the perfect time because we didn't have to change anything after half time. Like we could literally just went about our business, what we were doing, because it is much as it looked like we was probably going to score. They were getting shots away from distance and stuff. We were quite solid. The same with Tuesday. But I, I, any win away at West Brom is a very, very good win. Because they're a very, very good side. at the top end of the league for a reason. And as I say, I think that's the first time they've lost since the middle of February. And we've ultimately done a job on them. If a few half chances here and there, the scoreline could have been a bit more comfortable. But I think, yeah, you're nitpicking if you criticising that a little bit for not being as ruthless as we could have been. But I happy with the three points. It was very, very good three points. Yeah, I think I think I'll take it as well. Look, I, I I do think we'll look a bit more defensive under Dodds and we have sat back a little bit in the Leeds games, obviously another one where it was. But ultimately like we've kept clean sheets and I guess Michael Bowers and Dave are gonna love this. You know, clean sheets mean you, you don't lose. Um, and it gives you a platform to build on, which when you want to lose and run the way that we were, we needed a platform to build on it. Um, we'll come on to sort of the, the first big talking point, Ross. I think the red card changed a lot. However, we can't be blamed for that. Um, it wasn't like a lucky red card. We don't normally speak about the opposition, but what's the boy doing? Like, And, and the hate towards Ballard, Within that question, I don't know. I mean, look, I can't say anything from a perspective of a fan that still gets angry at Casey Keller for an incident that happened in 1993 <laughs> in August. Um, I still would boo him if he still played. So maybe I'm, you know, being hypocritical here. But I don't know. I kind of forgot about the tackle until the lad mentioned it in the preview show on on Madger. Um, and I don't know. For for me, Ballard's tough and he's a unit, but he's never struck me as. Is dirty, but if you go on Twitter, which is no barometer of any fan base, let's be honest, it's entertaining. But it was it was the strikers' own stupid fault today, and it got nothing to do with Ballard, did it? Yeah, like, but you say that, like, obviously as players, it should be totally different at the fan base. Like, I know they can have a bit of resentment, but to me, every player try to leave, that was near Ballard try to leave one on him today, and it was like they purposely went out there to injure him, which for professional footballers, to me, is a bit like. Amateurish. I know you say that it's under league, lower league level, maybe, but oh well. Championship professional players, come on. Sante, it just, I don't, I don't know what's going through his head. Like, the tackle on Clark's bad enough. Um, But then, literally, I think it was about a minute later, to then, he was nowhere near the ball. In the, let's be honest, it's not exactly like one where if he could nick it, he's in. It's in the middle of the pitch. There's nothing really, there's no danger for anyone. And it just seemed desperate and mindless. But again, as you mentioned, it, it we can't be blamed for that. And it's it's nice in a way that we've had that bit of stroke of luck where nobody's been hurt. And I actually thought I actually thought that we reacted to it really well. For a change, sometimes you get a red card and you can be a, the opposition team can be a bit like, right, we're gonna sit back and sometimes I think we can get a bit spooked and just keep the ball. But we, we actually went with intent and so well, for the goal. He was the spare man, wasn't he? So I think there's small margins. That's it, you know. That could be the extra, the extra player, Mark and Ekwa, when he somehow manages to just be on his own in the middle of the box from a set piece, which was a very good ball by Styles, by the way. I know I've bigged him up before, saying it was his best game for us, but I thought his delivery was very good today as well. If I'm being a bit uh, analytical, yeah, I thought Styles did all right today. I think um, what I would say about Styles playing well, maybe the past couple of games are looking better. I'll throw this one at you, Lee. The formation's changed the past few games. We've gotten that back three. I think there's a few times when, I think specifically me and Brad have spoke about how we sort of prefer the back three with the wing backs. Um, we played it quite a bit last season, almost out of necessity. And fair enough, you had like Dennis Circle on the left-hand side of that, of the, the back three and potentially better players within it. But you can't say that, you know, Leeds away, uh, West Brom away, yielded results with that, but defence hasn't conceded a goal, hasn't really looked amazing going forward, but it's looked very sturdy and solid at the back. When our better players come back, 
Uh, no offense to the players that are on the pitch today, but you know, the likes of Dennis Sirk and players that can fit into that formation. Is there possibly an argument for saying that is our best formation and gets the best out of the players that um, we have at the moment? I thought that when I was watching the game that all oh, we set up better and we look more solid defensively when you're playing a three. Um, again, we are now we tried against Swans and it didn't work due to the fact that you didn't have the right personnel because obviously we were a right wing back short, we were a centre back short and obviously I, I say I know he's come in, he's done okay his first two games but I don't really didn't really read he held on the left wing back uh, the left centre back and he looked a bit lost but um, I, I think it's our best formation as you say with people come back getting a, a fit Aji Alisi in getting Dennis Serkin in I think it looks really, really well because then you can even come to the point where you could have like overlapping centre backs as well, with like your Hume and your Lee saying it could make us look quite dangerous going forward as well. And obviously, Chad Clark likes to come inside, so you'll always have that width. You'll always have that width. I think, I think it is. I prefer the three at the back, what the people we have, than the four two three one and the four three three. Personally, I just think when you look at the results over there, I mean, I'm sure there'll be like st- stat- statisticians. I don't know, stat was, uh, that can tell me all the good results we've had were, were four at the back and, and the formation we would usually play. But I just think over the past couple of seasons, we've we've looked all right. We're back three. I think Leeds at home and Leeds away were basically both those back three formations. And whilst neither of the games we were massively inventive for a long time, and again, I'll use the word caveat, but there has been caveats to the those performances. I think those times last season when we had like Dennis Serk on the left-hand side of that back three and there's been times when Seals played on the right-hand side of the back three this season where I just think, I think we look pretty good in the back three and I, I, I wouldn't be completely against, you know, a team next year with that sort of formation in place. But I mean, realistically, um, you'll never really know, I suppose, until next season and what happens in the, the recruitment. But um, Ross, I'm just, because like I say, this is probably the quickest we've ever reacted to a game, I think. And I'm looking through the questions that people have, and I'm just looking through Twitter um, as we're chatting. And I'll be honest, there's a fair amount of like negativity. Um, one of the questions asks why Dodgy's getting any level of praise um, because the football's defensive and diet, even against 10 men. Um, it's not papering over cracks, it's papering over the Grand Canyon. Happy to win, but the tactics second half weren't changed and we'd set up to defend. And someone said, who would win between Dodgers, Sunderland and Parkinson, Sunderland, or would it just be the most boring 90 minutes of football ever? I ah, suppose I sort of understand that question a bit, but um, a bit surprised at the negativity um, in the, my immediate reaction, also, if I'm honest with you. Um, I think that can, I think that's just a symptom of the whole season, isn't it? Let's be honest. Yeah. I think, if you're, in, I think if you're in that away end of the day, you probably have, you've had a good day and you've enjoyed yourself, but if you're just looking from the outset and you're watching it, 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 let's be honest, I think without the red card, we don't win that game. I'm not going to lie. I think it, the red card, small margins, does change things because I, I can't think of maybe an attack we had in anger w- until that point. But we say that, and we went to Swansea under Mowbray. They went down yeah. to 10 men, and we, we, didn't, we didn't win it. So maybe the time of the goal that we scored, like... Ultimately, right. it was defensive and, and stuff like that. And look, I I understand the Dodds question. Like, I'd much prefer to be more attacking and win. I'm a bit like Dave. I'd prefer to win 4-3 than 1-0. Um, but I just think we need wins. Like, ultimately, however we get them at the minute, we just need to build a, some sort of positivity. So I'll I'll take a kind of boring dire 1-0 and then we fix, you know, what we need to fix in the summer, hopefully. Yeah, I get I get your point. I can see other I can see the other argument where is it is defensive and it is negative, I think, from the outset. And then I also see the other side of it where this is what we have at our disposal at the moment. And unfortunately, at the present time we're not good enough to go toe to toe with these top six teams. So the only way we're gonna really compete or nick points or nick three is by playing defensive and containing them rather than attacking them. Um and ideally as a club that we, we can't do that next season. We know that we need to be able we need to be better, we need to have better players, we need to have better management. We just overall need to improve on every aspect. And that's for the summer. But for the short term for now, I feel like 
we got the result that we, as you mentioned before, Swansea, we, you're going to react different ways to a red card and that was one where we didn't react well today. We we got the goal and we, I think they had one shot from Swift that went wide, but can't think Patterson having to make much of a save. They had, they had a spell where I think the crowd got up momentum, you know what I mean, that can happen. Um, and I do feel like we had chances to kill the game off, like when McClark put the side net and I think you had a better chance to maybe slide it across the box. But again, it's very minimal stuff, I think. But overall, I can see both sides. It, it, it's not pretty, it's not great, and but it's it's been, today was okay and we won. And I think that, that's kind of a summary of the whole season where it hasn't been pretty at times. It has been very negative, but sometimes we've won and it's been all right. <laughs> I, I think that's a decent summary. I think f- for me, Lee, the most important question, and I think everyone's probably been waiting for me to ask this, does the win, um, does it overshadow the fact that Hummel's back, which is the most important thing at this point in the season? <laughs> <laughs> I love Hummel, me. So I see I'll always be at the top of the priority list when it comes to stuff like this. When it comes to this week, you got the. I'm just pleased to get rid of the template shite. To be honest with you, like we've had Adidas for years, then just getting templates and getting nag templates all the time. And now they tried the best this season to make it look like a kit of previous years, but it's just nice to get a, a kit that's obviously rich in our history, and also that will put an effort in to make us look presentable. And that, it sounds like a stupid thing to see it and make us look presentable on and off the pitch, whether that be the training gear, the kit itself, because it's not worse than playing football in, the, in a rubbish kit, is there really? I mean, I've got out against this year's kit, but I'm saying it's just it's humble, isn't it? It always takes top priority over everything else. I mean, it's probably a generation of people who use Twitter grew up with Hummel. And I think, um, and it sounds daft that we're discussing this, but we're at this point in the season where kids really matter. Um, but there is probably a bit of deepness about this. Um, I'm a massive Nike fan. Look, and this is not what I expected to be saying on a Southern podcast, but I'm a huge Nike fan. Like I love my Nike Air, I love my, my trainers and all that kind of stuff. Um, but like, so the kits were nice with Nike. I thought some of them were actually quite nice. I was one of the only few that really liked it, but the Hummel stuff, like, genuinely really excited. Um, I got a bit stick yesterday because I'd said I'd seen a couple of them, um, but I think it's relatively well known that the stuff out there now where the, the third kit's going to have the 73 badge, I think, um, from what I've seen, and it is, like, a grey sort of green colour with, like, Part, like silvery bits in and um, the home kit very similar to the one that was leaked not too long ago but with more chevrons from memory um but i think you know it's ultimately doesn't matter to kit ross right it, it doesn't really matter like i don't care what we're wearing as long as it's red and white in many ways in winning games um but i think we've had a lot of discussions this season about the board and stuff like that uh, I am certainly not convinced that they're the right people at the minute are doing the right things because they've suddenly got Hummel on board. But we, you know, for balance, I don't think we can come on podcasts that like we did at the start of the season, get really, really frustrated about um, the products on offer, the lack of shirts in there, the, the lack of opening times, I think as it was, and ticket offers and stuff like that. I think it'll take a heck of a lot, again, a lot of trust for a million and one things. I've already said that the Black Cat Spa thing will live with me forever, and I'm really struggling with that. But ultimately, silly little things like kits and nailing what your kit should be and understanding your fan base via your marketing campaigns, making sure there's enough kits stocked, making your stadium look a bit more presentable. It's it's not bottom of the barrel, but it's the much less important things than the actual stuff on the pitch, which is the most important thing that needs to be fixed. But it's good to see them understanding some stuff. I think they've changed the where we're going to be able to buy the kits as well, which is from Fanatics, which um, I've used Fanatics before for, for other stuff. I think England used the Fanatics page as well. Um, and it's much, much better buying from there. It's a step in the right direction as opposed to like a step back. And it doesn't feel like two steps forward, one step back either. It, it genuinely feels like a step forward or two steps forward and people are happy with it. It's 
it's identifying with a lot of people. And, you know, when I look at Hummel stuff, I remember my first games. I went in 93 for my first game. So this stuff that's coming out was bang on. My love and nostalgia period of Sunderland. So it reminds me of why I love Sunderland. And I think it's just little tweaks like that will push us in the right direction. Um, and wherever you sit on this, Ross, that, that needs to happen, doesn't it? Yeah. I think the nostalgia part's a good thing. Like everyone loves a retro kitten. It's been a bit of an irk for me for years that the club have never really like bought into that kind of side. Like the amount of I'd say when you go to games, the amount of retro football shirts you see, especially at Sunland, these like now it's huge. And they're clearly sourced from elsewhere. So that's revenue the club are missing out from. So from a commercial point of view, it makes perfect sense. And I think this is probably the first big move we've seen from David Bruce, the new guy. I think I've got his name right there. Is Bruce, it in. Bruce? Bruce in. Bruce uh, in. Hi, Brucey. In. <laughs> I've always said Bruce would be good for Sunderland. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's it it's good to have a bit of commercial now. Um, I've seen the change of the flags from outside the stadium after getting slated on Twitter from them. Yeah, I when mean... they were riffing there. Like, yeah, I just wish they could fucking sign a striker as quick and easy as the day. You know what I mean? They, they take all the criticism on board about the stadium and the kitchen and they'll change them straight away. We've been saying for three years, sign a striker, and they still can it. So we're, we're one part off. In a nutshell, we need Stu Harvey to start following everybody on uh, <laughs> on, <laughs> on Twitter. But now you see, it's just, it's just a just got to have a a bit of nostalgia back, and just I don't know how to say it. A bit of positivity, really, in it. Like it's again, it's meaningless if we're shit on the pitch. Let's not bat around the bush. But at the same time, if we can get the stadium improvements done, if we can it just look presentable, make money. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's the top moment. Make money for the club. Like how many years have we said like just you you you're literally wait you're not getting money because we can't people want to spend money on the club. The massive fans them, they want revenue going into the club. They want the stadium to be decked out in red and white shirts on a match day, but they weren't allowing it and now hopefully we're on the right steps for that to happen. Yeah, and I think um, I think it's a pride thing as well. Look, um, there'll be people uh, kicking about that are not fans of the Hummel designs and think that you know you shouldn't go backwards on your kids and stuff like that. And that's that's totally valid as well. Minority, I think, but there will be someone somewhere that thinks that. But it sounds really daft. Um, I remember the lowest standards I think have ever been at Sunderland Sands that championship season was when we went down with fifteen points and just. We all remember what it was like like, around that sort of period. And then we all remember the kind of like Phoenix on the Flames rise and Quinny taking over at Drummerville and Roy Keane coming in. And we laugh at like stuff like um, that Roy Keane did. And and we laugh at like the little things he he did when he first came in and throughout his time here. But I think one thing that there's a reason that a lot of people sometimes like the idea of Roy Keane coming back because of how much he lifted the standards. And I think one thing that we, we all see for Sunderland is that there should be standards there that match our heritage, match our history, match who we feel we are as people and who we are as a club and a community. And Roy Keane definitely matched those because he respected our club and he was a world-class footballer, a very, very intelligent man, a very, very a, a man that's got very, very strong standards. And I remember him years later or someone telling the story about how much he hated the Lonsdale kits because he thought we looked like trash. And it's funny but to be fair, it's a really valid point. Like you lift your standards up across the board. Yes, on the pitch is the thing that matters the most. But your stadium looking clean, your flags outside looking proud and and flying, your fans feeling proud of you know their home, the seats looking like they're not like dirty and messy, like not loads of like trash swirling around the stadium. Like your kits looking nice, your kits identifying with who you are. You're not just having a template that Barcelona have got for their home kit. You've got your own kit because you believe whether people think we're right or wrong, we should have the best bespoke kit because we're Sunderland. Maybe some other championship clubs listening going, well, whatever. But we're Sunderland. We're one of the biggest clubs in this country. No matter what, based on fan base, we should have a bespoke kit. We should be getting excited. The, the manufacturer should be getting excited about doing stuff for us. And it's just a couple of things where we really need to lift the standard not just with kits, not just with like giving the bloody stadium like a paint or a clean now and again. It needs to be done on the pitch. But the whole thing needed to be lifted standard-wise. 
And again, I'm asking the same question I asked Ross, but it's a start, isn't it, Lee, if we're going to be positive? Yeah, definitely. I mean, okay, the brass mate start by getting a decent kit supplier in, but then you're going further down the pick and the pick and order. Christian Speakman's got to lift his standards for getting the right players in. Stuart Harvey's got to lift his standards by going scouting the right players and getting them in. Then you've got to go and get the right head coach in who's also got to lift the standards. Then that'll come onto the pitch and it literally just comes down from the top. And there's no surprise when you see like and not, not a coincidence, sorry, when you see that our drop in form has led from like the piss poor thing that happened in January, like the whole thing. Like if the people at the top don't care, why should the players going out there who but I, I, it's all right being a chairman, been an owner, been a sports director, but it's ultimately the players on the pitch that get the most abuse for 90 minutes a week, 90 minutes a week, like who get slagged off and slagged off and slagged off. So if the people at the top don't care, it obviously comes down to saying why is the people underneath them should care. So if they can raise standards at the top end and hopefully fall down, we should see a better Sunderland Football Club next season. And it's it's a daft thing just because we're getting a new kit supplier. As you said, it's a start. It's a start for us moving forward and righting wrongs that we've gone like righting the wrongs that have gone wrong this season. So it's getting the right appointments in, getting the right players in, making the right stuff off the field, and get all that right, and everybody be happy. Everybody be happy. Then they'll get support of everybody. This is it's it's easy. It's easy. I think when there'll be people like maybe outside of Sunderland listening to this and going, Oh, they've done half a podcast on shirts. Um Correct. Accurate. Yes, we have. But I think you probably have to be part of Sunderland and the fan base to understand how low the the basic standards of like retails have fallen. Um, and I said before, I'll never forgive them for the, the Black Cats bar thing, but like whether I forgive them or not doesn't really matter. Um, they're here, so things need to change and things need to get better. And if... <laughs> If we're coming on podcast criticizing the, the retail offerings that they've had this season alongside things on the pitch, it's it's worth crediting them when it looks like they've they fixed something the marketing's quite good. But um Ross, we'll go to sort of listeners' questions before we finish off, because let's be honest, yes, we won. That's class. I'm buzzing. I'll be happy until next Saturday. Um, however, in reality, there's not too a great deal to talk about. The lads played all right, probably a bit too defensively, probably might not have won with out the red card, that was their fault. We did win. It's fine. You know, up the Dan Ballard and all that kind of stuff. I think that's the podcast for today. Um, so we'll go to listeners' questions because there's some decent ones. The first question uh, is quite nice. It's from another Graham. Very good name. Spot with a H as well. Now the season's practically over. Are you going anywhere nice during the off-season? Um, I have a holiday some up next week, actually. But uh, Ross, I'll let you go first. You got anywhere nice planned? No, I haven't. Um, probably just going away during the season next year. The prices of stuff, you know, I mean, scandal. That, that that's another podcast. The price of this country to go on anyway is a joke. But no, I'm in a way though. I'm looking forward to just spend time with family and hopefully getting good news on the transfer front and seeing our brand new tweaked model, as has been reported. So hopefully, yeah, I've seen that. Can I can I tell you where I'm going? Can I can I like? Get excited go on, about rub, it. rub it in a bit more whilst I'm stuck in the North East. Go on then. I'm going to Washington DC on Thursday. Oh, it's all right. Do you want to? Can I tell you another thing that'll make you even more jealous? Go on then. It's free. It's for a work trip. Honestly, you're the only person I know who could fall and shit and come out smelling roses. And look at this good. And look at this good. <laughs> Unbelievable, you are. I, well, Lee, you, Lee, you going anywhere just to rub it in a bit more? Or are you? Or you does the pub? Logo. Does the pub count? Aye. Probably just the pub, really. Honestly, over the summer, so I can afford. Just got the pub. I'm I've looking forward to like cricket. I like me cricket. So in the I... in the felling felling cricket club, right in the close to mine, just in the beer garden. The sun, it, honestly, it's like a sun trap. I'll have the reddest headed and gated, and I'll be happy because I'll have a pint in my hand. Got a question here for you, right? Because we've we've entered this point of the season where like we've never had this before where we're not fighting for anything. It's just we're just here and we've won, so we're relatively happy. So let's keep with some daft questions. If you don't like daft questions, just turn off now. It's fine. Um but I was talking about this this morning. So I was watching a YouTube video about the roughest pubs, and they didn't have a Sunland edition, which is unfortunate. And it made me think, what's my favorite pub in Sunland? And I think mine's dead obvious, but I'm gonna what's your favorite pub? 
Lee, in Sunland? What's the best Sunland pub? And, and the roughest, if you want, or, or, unless it's the same. Um, the best pub in Sunland is probably the Millview Club mm. in uh, in Roker. Mint. Mint. They've got everything on that you need, and it's cheap as chips. Shout out for the Cooper Rose, though. Like, I think it's underrated. On night, when you go to town on a night out, the Cooper Rose, I... I but. once stayed in the Cooper Rose that long after we beat Pompey in the playoffs, League One, first leg. I, I thought it was like half 11, so I was dancing and singing that song about Charlie White, um, which I'm sure many will <laughs> recall. And I thought it was like half 11, and then suddenly all the lights came on in the Cooper Rose. And I'll tell you, that's a fucking rude awakening, that. Like, um, the roughest part, the Blanford. I'm sorry, but it just feels like I always feel like I'm going to get beat up when I go in for a pint there. I could be wrong, but um, the Blanford for me. Ross, what's your uh, your favourite Sunday pub? Yeah, I do like a Cooper Rose. Like, ah, it's I do like around there. Uh, Life Riley, I think I like Life Riley. It's all right, to be honest, as well. You know, it's one of them classic ones where it's... And do you know what, as well? I like, I like the fire station now. I think it's a lovely pint in there. It's a nice, respectable place, the fire station. Ah, right. so... You what's know, that, I like the fire station. What's that new but, one that's opened? There's like a cocktail bar. I went in the other week before the Swansea game on the Friday night because I stayed over. Is that the Botanist? Or is it the Keel Tavern? Something like that. The Keel Tavern. Aye. It's nice round there, nice. right? Fair play. Aye. Just nice. Also, did you see, I know we're going about the summer, did you see where Sullen's getting a proper fan zone? Oh, what? For the Euros. Yeah. The Lucas Aid fan zone. They're giving like a proper fan zone there for the um, all the Euros games. Do you know what? Well, I answered that question about until I bragged about where I was going next week, but I'm going to, I'm actually going to Euros. I'm going for a game. Oh, for fuck's sake. Do, I know. do you know what, Graham? We carry you through the season. We get knee fangs, knee get Ali freebies. You know what no, I mean? I, I paid for that one, but I've got to fly, <laughs> right? So, what I'm doing, right? I'm flying to Amsterdam from Manchester, I think. And then I've got to go. To, uh, I've got to get a bus to Stuttgart or Frankfurt or something. I can't even remember. One of those flex buses. Um, and then Ash is going to see Scotland play. It. Then I'm darting off to where England's playing. I think it's Stuttgart or Frankfurt or something. But then I've got to fly back to Dublin from Frankfurt, stay in Dublin for eight hours, which is a dangerous game because I really like a pint of Guinness, and then get the flight back to Glasgow. So I'm going for literally one game in the middle. Um, people have switched off by now, haven't they? they yeah, apologies off. to the Welsh fans here who have switched off. Um, uh, sorry, that was low. Is there any Welsh fans that will be listening? I think so. I'm sure I've seen a Welsh Sunderland flag before. This is if going you're back Welsh, while. let us know, because I didn't know the Hello, words. Danny Collins. Sorry for... <laughs> if you're listening, Danny, Danny Collins, Collins, I'm really sorry. Uh, you've got to hope that Niall Huggins will be listening as well. Um, I hope he's all well. I said, I said last week's podcast was the worst podcast ever. I think we might be... Uh, <laughs> we might be getting to that point. Let's get back to the football quick. Uh, oh God, the first question I see, never really want to ask, but I'm not going to ask it because it's one of your daft, well, one of one of your daft bones. Um, let's see what we got. <laughs> Someone asking about the Hummel kits. Uh, best formation. Ah, uh, okay, one from Andrew. So, what do we do with Job Lee? I think you just put him back in his box to box midfield role, to be honest. If he wants to be a box to box midfielder, make him a box to box midfielder. He's filled the gap. I'm not gonna lie, he has filled the gap and he is the best of a ba- he is the best of a bunch, but let's be honest there, other than Rusin, who's uh, none of the other two have showed anything. Well, three if you count my ender. <laughs> but I think if he really <laughs> wants to be a box to box midfielder, focus on his box to box midfield role. Because I said in the group chat, and I mean I know he scored the winner today. I don't think Pierre Edgar gets in our strongest team because if you're going to look at our strongest team, I think if, you, if you're if you playing the 3-4-3, I think Job next to Dan Neal suits us better than Pierre Edgar does because I think he'll actually you know, get his foot in and make a tackle and not just half arse attempt to make a tackle. But he did, I think it was, without trying to dig, dig Edgar out, I think it was like 10 minutes to go. And I think it was John Swift gone past him. He has me and Nephilim, he's trying to pull him back. But even that, he's pulled back. It was like a half attempt at a pullback. I think he's, if he wants to be a box to box midfielder, make him a box to box midfielder. I think, I think I don't think he's creative enough to be in the number ten. If that makes sense, I think he's. Um, 
I find he's more like an old fashioned number ten, which is I don't know. I I think he will do well by like I think he knows where the net is, but not enough to get you like twenty odd goals a season, which means he's not a striker. But he's probably good enough to like arrive in the box late. Um, I don't know, like a you know, like Gary Speed used to. Like a Gary Speed used to like arrive late in the box and he would get you goals. And I mean, he's, he got loads or numerous clubs playing that sort of style. I see him sort of in that sort of sense. But I wanted to quickly ask what Equa there was to matter. Because he scored today, really well taken. Uh, there's been a bit of conversation around. I've seen a few, few people saying he's been scapegoated this season or he gets more criticism than most. Um, I'll be honest, Ross, he's one player that I've probably. I don't want to say gone in hard on, but I've not been impressed with this season. Um, and a few people are saying he's young, you know, we learn and stuff like that. But I think Ekwa is probably a really valid point because today is a good day for him because he scored. But my biggest concern with Ekwa is not his talent. It's really not what I'm worried about. I think he's a very talented kid. I think you can quite clearly see he has that. But there's still something where I feel like he shirks a tackle or he's a bit too weak in the tackle. And that concerns me the most. But in your opinion, is Equa scapegoated more than most, or do you think the criticism's fair? No, I think the criticism's been fair this season. Where well, he's had some really good games. Like the start of the season, he was outstanding. Mm. And since his leg died and they had to replace him with a new <laughs> one, it's been shite, hasn't it? The, uh, the, must the be that new leg. leg. Yeah, the new leg. The transplant hasn't worked. Let's be honest. He needs another one in the summer. We we'll go again. Um, the deadest leg ever. Let's be honest. He was out for about two months, funny, with a dead leg. Um, but yeah, it's it's one of them where it's you're going to be questioned as a fan base no matter what we do when we say about players because it's such a young group. It's going to be a case of oh, you're being a bit harsh on these lads because they're too young. But unfortunately, if they're in the starting eleven wearing a Sunderland DSC shirt in the championship, it's fair game for me. You know what I mean? Like Rick, the only one I think you could probably give an exception to was Chris Rigg because he's literally still a child. Yeah, and then. Even most games a season he started, he's been really good. You know what I mean. And again, it's getting him tied down to a professional deal is gonna be massive. Ricky, because that's honestly, one thing. like he doesn't look out of place at all. That's the biggest like, that's compliment a... you can give him, though, yeah. isn't it? We're Ricky. Like when you watch him, like we haven't even discussed him today. If a sixteen-year-old plays like your third or fourth, what's he played like five of the last six games or something from the start? Yeah, he, he like should that. be like the the main. But it's almost like we've just expected him to be that good because we know how talented he is. Genuinely very we... worried. We're losing for very little. Yeah, that's the only issue is we need to get him sign up deal. But at the same time, I feel like from a from a personal perspective, I don't think like he could have asked for much more from Sunderland. No. At this age, he's been given ample opportunities to start championship games. Um fans love him. He's been he's been protected well, the fans love him. He's playing week in week out in the championship at his age. You know what I mean? There's not many kids. There's not many sixteen year old kids going to be doing that at any level, playing week in week out in, in English football. So yeah, it's 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 one of them where I hope, I really hope he does stay because it's a success story not just for himself but also for the academy that's took a lot of a lot of hits over the last few years. Let's be honest, and um, the, the, it's it's one of them where. If he does go, now he's played championship games, we should get some good money for him as well. But let's hope it doesn't come to that. Yeah, I really would not like to see that happen. But uh, lads, thanks for joining. Uh, the difficult to do these ones, even with a win, it appears. But hopefully everyone at home's enjoyed it. We'll try to just kind of go off the cuff. And if you haven't enjoyed it, it's no bother. I told you he's not subscribed, so I warned you months ago. Uh, but Lee and Ross, <laughs> thanks for joining. Uh, nearly there. We're nearly there. Hello and welcome to the What the Fork review show where we have won a game that I suppose doesn't really matter, but winning is nice. Uh, we are reacting immediately after the game. It's just after five o'clock, so not much uh, prepared necessarily. And I'm going to be going to the cinema, so you're probably not going to get this till in the morning. But this was sort of the hour we had to record, give or take. But uh, I'm joined by Ross Black after a win. Aye, a nice win, a nice win. Um mm-hmm. That was for Dan Ballard.